just said, oh, no. Again, they're on to us. Oh, um, my gosh. Um, you know, I, I shared with you <laughs> earlier, um, we have students here from Retreat Weekend. Woo! And so, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, Y'all are awesome. Um, they looked a little tired. I look a little tired. I wish we had um, a camera that we could go right here. Yeah. <laughs> I feel a little tired. Yeah, um, I bet. And so I, I wanted to wake us up today. By like... And wake some students up today. <laughs> oh, please, I'm not that good. Okay, um, but, all right. <laughs> but a little... I'm not Pastor West. I can't play guitar oh, and sing and do all that. Right, um, yeah. You know, I only got a trumpet. Um, so a little known fact that you all might not know. I know you know this, Taylor. Mm -hmm. um, but I was in band all through middle and high school. Now, please, yeah, I know... Yeah, kid, kid. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Let's thank God for his teachers that had to deal with him. Yeah, pray for them. Um, um, I know you're shocked, by the way, that I wasn't the high school quarterback and that I was in band. <laughs> but please, please, I know I'm still getting over it, too. Um, so I was in band all through middle and high school, um, and I played the trumpet. I actually played in the... We had trumpets here in the praise band years ago, and I actually mm -hmm. was part of that. Um, and I thought I would bring it today to prove to you that I know how to play the trumpet. That's unnecessary, Taylor. <laughs> so let's see what this, it's been. Let's see. I graduated 2011. Let's carry the one. It's been a while since I've actually played okay. the trumpet in a professional setting. Thomas, are you ready? I don't want to, like, you know, scare anyone too much. All right, here we go. Let's see what I got. A Star Spangled Banner. Star Spangled Banner. Okay. Da, da, da. No, uh, no, that <laughs> wasn't on. it. That I'll wasn't it. Let me find it. Hold on. Hold on. Let me try again. I'll find the note. Da, da, da. No, that's not it. That's not hold on, it. Hold on, let me go something more my speed. Hold All on, right. I, I, more I know, your, the, more your I know speed. this one. Okay. I got this one down. You ready? Yeah. Yeah, let's get up for Taylor Brown. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. TB, that was great, but what, what are you getting at? Well, I wanted to audition for the worship team. Oh, West okay. be up here. I, wanna, I want my spot. Um, no, so, so I brought this today because it brought me back to the summer before sixth grade when I first got my trumpet. And, I, and my mom, she agreed to pay for private lessons so I'd have sort of a leg up going into middle school in band. And I remember I get to my first lesson... And with a really smart guy, he's been playing trumpet for years, like he knew it. And so I, I remember going into the lesson so excited, waiting to learn like all the secrets of how to be a really good trumpet player, right? Like I want to know how to push the valves really quick, and I want to know how to play really loud, because my mom was paying for that mostly. I want to play really loud for my mom in the house. Um, and I wanted to know like all the tips and tricks on how to become the best trumpet player ever. And so we sit down for the first lesson, I got my trumpet out, and he did something that surprised me, my teacher. We spent that lesson figuring out how to tune the trumpet. And I was kind of like surprised by that because I'm like, this doesn't seem pertinent to what I need to know. And so my teacher could tell by the look on my face. And so he said, I'm going to tell you something. I never forget him saying this. He said, you could be the best valve pusher there ever was. You could play loud enough to fill a football stadium. You could have as much knowledge as you could possibly have about the trumpet. But if your horn is not in tune and in harmony, it does not matter. He said, none of it matters if you're not in tune. And while that's important for music people and trumpet players to know, I think there's a lesson here when it comes to our life in harmony and in tune with God. That the same is true for us, that we could talk about a lot of things that are really important, but I would argue one of the most important things for us to focus on as followers of Jesus is are we living a life that is in harmony or in tune with God? And I know this is important because Jesus actually talked about it. Jesus, when he was here on earth, he was having a conversation with his followers about this word remain or abide in him. And he makes this pretty awesome promise that we see in verse 4 of chapter 15 of the book of John. Jesus said, remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself and must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless what? You remain in me. Jesus makes this promise, this declaration that we can be fruit bearing people but it means we have to remain connected to Jesus. We have to live in harmony or in tune with God. Now, I know that a lot of us strive for harmony in all areas of life. We strive for harmony 
with God. We strive for harmony in our relationships. But I know that, at least for me, Taylor, um, a lot of the time I see disharmony happening in some areas of life. Yeah, absolutely. We can really think about some of the relationships that we may have in our lives that are not harmonious. And mm-hmm. Instead, there's a lot, they're out of tune. They're, they're, uh, there's disharmony. Think about maybe that coworker, and I mean that coworker at work, right? Where you try to avoid that person at all costs because steam just comes out of your ears whenever you're around them, right? Students, maybe you can think of that kid in your class that just drives you crazy. I had that kid that used to sit behind me and shake their leg on my desk the whole time. And I just wanted to get so angry. I've got some issues about that actually, 20 years later. Maybe for you it's your neighbor. Maybe this is your drive home after A long day, you're driving, you click the button to open the garage door, you pull into the garage, you click the button to close the garage door, then you get out of your car, right? Because you don't want to have to talk to your neighbor because there's not harmony there. But I think some of the most painful places when there's disharmony is the relationships that are closest to us, the people that we live with, maybe a spouse, a roommate, a, a best friend, that when those relationships are disharmonious, disharmonious, that uh, it, it's a struggle. It's painful. It could be with your children as well. You know, there were a few months ago, uh, Taylor, where I had a long day. And, and I think that all of us have a grace meter, right? Your, your grace meter can be on full, it can be halfway, or it can be empty, right? I'm on empty a lot of times when I'm with t- TB. No, just, just kidding, Taylor. Well, there's a day where I used the whole tank. There was no, I was below empty. And I got home and I snapped at my kids. I just lost my mind over something stupid. And then my wife came to talk to me and I was short with her. And we even had this cute little puppy and I was mean to the puppy. It was just one of those days. But then it happened. I had a come to Jesus moment with my wife. Well, she had a come to Jesus moment with me, I guess. And she pulled me aside. Good save. Oh, whew, yeah. And she said, she said to me, she said, Taylor, the same pastor, Taylor, that everyone gets to experience during the day, your kids need that, Taylor. Oh, that hurt. But she was right. But friends, it's so true that the people that we're closest to, they get to see the good, the bad, and the ugly of all of us. They get to see our brokenness, our frailty, our sinfulness, our mistakes, our weaknesses. And in those tight circles that we have, a lot of times they do see the brokenness. And this leads us to our story in Nehemiah. The last several weeks we've been in this series where we've been walking through the book of Nehemiah. If you haven't been with us in the last several weeks, let me encourage you to read the book of, of Nehemiah, but then also you can go to our website or our app and catch up with us. But if you haven't been here, let me just remind you where we are in this story. You see, Nehemiah was a cupbearer to the king of Persia. Nehemiah had heard that the walls and the gates had crumbled in Jerusalem, and he felt this passion to go travel 900 miles to rebuild the wall. So he got permission to do that. He travels, he gathers a team of fellow Jews, and they begin their efforts to rebuild the wall. They're about halfway through the rebuild when there are some outsiders, some notable outsiders, who began uh, trying to disarm them, began threatening the Jews, and then also really uh, threatening Nehemiah's good name. But Nehemiah responded so well by continuing to trust in the Lord's power to strengthen Nehemiah and the fellow Jews. And that brings us to our next part in Nehemiah's story today. After dealing with some outside opposition, Nehemiah now has trouble a little bit closer to home with his fellow Jews. And we see this disharmony starting to bubble up a little bit. So let's look together at what happens next in Nehemiah chapter five, verses one through six. You'll see it on the screen and you can follow along. Now the men and their wives raised a great outcry against their fellow Jews. Some were saying, we and our sons and daughters are numerous. In order for us to eat and stay alive, we must get grain. Others were saying, we are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our homes to get grain during the famine. Still others were saying, we have had to borrow money to pay the king's tax on our fields and vineyards. Although we are, on the, uh, although we are of the same flesh and blood as our fellow Jews, and, through, and though our children are as good as theirs, 
Yet we have to subject our sons and daughters to slavery. Some of our daughters have already been enslaved, but we are powerless because our fields and our vineyards belong to others. Now, if you just listened to that and read that and you got a little confused, that's okay, because honesty time, I got confused when I first read this too, prepping two weeks ago for this message. So let's talk a little bit about what's going on here. Um, the first thing I want you to notice is a couple times in those verses, uh, the, the, the phrase, their fellow Jews, w- was written. Here's what that's an indication of, as Taylor said. This is conflict that's happening from within, from inside the walls. We talked last week about opposition from, I called them Sanballat and crew, right? This is different than that. Sanballat and crew were outsiders trying to oppose the effort. This conflict was happening from inside the walls. These were like, you know, family members not getting along. And and the crux of the problem, it was a financial problem. I know you might be shocked that conflict sometimes happens when we have financial struggles. (laughs) Floored over it. I I couldn't believe it either. I've never experienced that in my life. Um, But conflict happens sometimes when money's involved. And there's these three groups of people here. We we, we can see them in the text. It's uh, landless farmers... It's farmers that mortgage their land, and it's people who borrowed money to pay for the king's tax. These three groups of people were all struggling financially. There was a socioeconomic crisis happening. And so when when you really think about this even further, if we boil this down even more, um, it wasn't just that there was a financial crisis, a financial problem. It's that they weren't showing much grace to one another during this crisis. Um, they were, you know, they, they were charging interest above what they should. They were depriving people of their land. And, you know, sons and daughters were having to go into slavery to be able to pay for things. This was a huge mess. And lots of conflict was happening between the people. And to add even more pain to it, you know, these are the people that are supposed to be united around one project. And now there's disunity in them. There's all this infighting and conflict. And, and, and trouble arose from inside the walls. And I think there's a couple lessons here for us. The first thing that we can take away from this is that trouble comes from near and far. That it's not just opposition from outside that comes in our life, but sometimes conflict from the inside rises up as well. And just like opposition, we talked about last week, it's not a matter of if it happens, it's a matter of when conflict happens. See, for a lot of my life, um, really up until I'd say the past couple of years, um, I lived what I call a conflict avoidance life. Um, because of my people-pleasing and perfectionism, I wanted to be perfect when it came to conflict. Like, I wanted to have no conflict with anyone, be, be liked by everyone, have no conflict, and just, like, like, kind of be peaceful all my days. Now, while that's a good thing to strive for, what I ended up doing was unhealthy to get that. I, I, whenever I had, like, a, a strong emotion that I wanted to express that might upset someone else, I would stuff it. I wouldn't share it. Whenever I had a different feeling or whenever there was something I felt like I needed to defend myself with, I, I wouldn't. I would just stuff it. Um, whenever I had a new idea or something creative and I wanted to share that, but I would risk, you know, squashing someone else's idea or someone else might not like it, I, I would stuff it. Until a few years ago when all this stuffing got played out in really unhealthy ways. Um, and, and so what happened is I discovered that instead of living a conflict avoidance life, what if I lived to be a great conflict you know, resolver instead? What if I focused on, instead of avoiding conflict, being the best at resolving conflict when it comes? And can I tell you what I discovered is in these days, I live more as the tailor that God created me to be. The messy, imperfect version of me, yes. But the part of me that's more me. Instead of stuffing all these things I was thinking and feeling, I, I, I now am able to share them and not be afraid of conflict. Does it stink when it happens? Absolutely but I know it's a part of life. So we don't have to be conflict avoiders today. We can, tra- we can you know, aim to be conflict resolvers. But there's another truth that's, that's apparent in this part of the story too, and it's this, that cracks and conflict threaten our rebuild. Mm-hmm. That conflict creates some cracks in our rebuild. It threatens the progress of it. What we see in the story is that this rebuild project is now in peril. The progress is threatened. And here's to add some even more complexity on top of the situation. Nehemiah, you might remember a few weeks ago we talked about this, that Nehemiah asked the workers to remain at the wall and work. But this created a shortage for farmers during harvest time. So Nehemiah's decision to have workers stay at the wall contributed to the financial strain that the people were feeling now. 
So Nehemiah is kind of like, like kind of responsible for some of this too. This is a pretty complex situation. And I also know that the conflicts in, that happen in your life can create cracks in your rebuild. Maybe your progress feels threatened today. Or maybe because of conflict you're experiencing, you, you don't feel as confident that God is with you or that this is the path that God has you on. I want to implore you today to not give up. We have a phrase in our recovery ministry that says, don't give up 10 feet from the miracle. What if in your relationships, in your conflict, what if you are just 10 feet away from God doing something extraordinary? What if you're 10 feet away from his healing power? You're 10 feet away from resolving that thing that's been tearing this relationship apart for years. What if you were just 10 feet away and you chose not to give up, to trust God to bring you through it as well? So with conflict brewing, with infighting happening, with with tensions high, how would Nehemiah respond? What would he do? Well, let's continue on with our story. When I heard their outcry and these charges, I was very angry. I pondered them in my mind and then accused the nobles and officials. I told them, you are charging your own people interests. So I called together a large meeting to deal with them and said, as far as possible, we have bought back our fellow Jews who were sold to the Gentiles. Now you are selling your own people only for them to be sold back to us. They kept quiet. Because they could find nothing to say. So I continued, what you are doing is not right. Shouldn't you walk in the fear of our God to avoid the reproach of our Gentile enemies? I and my brothers and my men are also lending money to people and grain. But let us stop charging interest. Giving back to them immediately their fields, vineyards, olive gardens, and houses. And also the interest you are charging them. 1% of the money, grain, new wine, and olive oil. So Nehemiah deserves a gold star here because he is brewing with anger. But what does he do? Does he immediately lash out? Does he go and ransack the homes of the landlords and the nobles? No, he doesn't do that. He pauses. How many times in our own life have we been angry and we just react? We just explode. We just type up something It's witty to put on Twitter or Facebook, something passive aggressive, and hit send, right? But Nehemiah teaches us that there's wisdom in pausing. And then something else happens that's just fascinating there. It's that I gotcha moment where he accuses the nobles and the officials, and what's their response? Nothing. I'm the last of five kids. Uh, in my family, and my siblings would call me the golden child as a child because I just used to be able to get away with things, or at least I thought I would get away with things. And there are so many moments in my life that I would do something like, say, get a permanent marker and draw the Mona Lisa on my parents' dining room wall. Where Did, I, did your dad practice the pause after you did that? Oh, no, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> But there was those moments I thought, oh, I'd just get away with it. And then I would be accused and just silent, yeah. just uh, uh, I'd done messed up, right? But we've all been there, right? When you've been called out and there's a moment where you realize, yep, I messed up and I have nothing to say. And we see here in this moment that Nehemiah has this holy discontent. He's not just angry. There's difference between a holy discontent, discontent and an angry response. Like being angry that your team lost in the Super Bowl, Taylor. That's not holy discontent. Do you want to go down this road? You heard me last week. <laughs> I, I, I'm, still, I'm still finding healing from that. Sorry, I just needed to just poke you a little yeah, bit. Yeah, thank you. I'll play my trumpet some more. But friends, Nehemiah had, <laughs> Nehemiah had a holy discontent. What a holy discontent is when you see something happening that God stirs up this flame in your heart where you say, no more, enough's enough. This is wrong, this is an injustice. I'm gonna speak up, I'm gonna take the high road, I'm not gonna take the low road, I'm gonna be above reproach and I'm gonna honor God and point people back to him. And that's what Nehemiah does in his response. He doesn't threaten the people that were doing harm to his fellow Jews. No, instead, 
he has this holy discontent in which he accuses and charges them of the things that they are doing unjustly. And he also says, he holds himself accountable and says, I, I've been doing the same thing and I'm going to stop doing it. He owns his own stuff in this moment. So how do they respond, TB? So we can see what the people do and it's incredible. We will give it back, they said. And we will not demand anything more from them. We will do as you say. Then I summoned the priests and made the nobles and officials take on an oath to do what they had promised. So check this out. The people just sort of say yes to what Nehemiah had asked them to do. They said, yes, we'll give it all back. We'll, we'll, we'll resolve this. And then Nehemiah takes it one step further. And he calls together some people to make an oath. Um, to basically make sure that they follow through with what they said they were going to do. And, and sometimes accountability is required for the most important things in life. That, that word accountability. I feel mm. like in church world, it's kind of got this negative association with it. Like it's almost this like fear-mongering word of accountability, right? I, I think of it like it's the Christian version of whack-a-mole. Like, like someone's just waiting to just strike you with a hammer every time you mess up, right? Like that's sometimes the vibe that we get when it comes to the word accountability. But I think that's an inaccurate and it's a shallow view of what that word really is. Here's what accountability really is in my eyes. It's making sure you do what you say you're going to do. Yeah. That's what accountability is. Yep. It's saying that you're going to do something, and accountability is just making sure you're going to actually do it. And can I tell you how much of a game changer that is when it be this becomes a view of accountability versus this, like, gotcha kind of mentality? Because that's what Nehemiah is trying to set up here. He's trying to make sure that the people do what it is they say that they're going to do. And why did this matter? Well, it wasn't just about playing nice. It wasn't just about so he, Nehemiah could say everyone's getting along. No, Nehemiah, he wanted unity among his people and it was for something bigger. See, when it comes to rebuilding, here's what I think is true for Nehemiah and, and, and these people and true for us today, and it's this, that rebuilding depends on unity of purpose. Let's say that together. Ready, set, go. Rebuilding depends on unity of purpose. That Nehemiah just didn't tell them what to do. That's not, that's not the lesson in this. It's not just what we should do in conflict. We're going to talk, Terry's going to have some stuff in a second about what we can do. But there's a bigger, more compelling thing to think about, and it's why should we resolve conflict in relationships? It's because there's a greater purpose behind it. It's not just so that we can all get along or that you can be less stressed. Like, are those benefits? Absolutely. But there's a greater unity that as followers of Jesus, you and I are called to. And when I think about you know, the great command from Jesus to love one another as I have loved you, and the great commission from Jesus to go and make disciples, both of those statements are grounded in unity. We cannot go and love others the way Jesus loved us if we aren't at peace and aren't loving the people like, like in our own homes. We can't go and make disciples if we're not making disciples in our own church. Are you hearing me? Unity is required for these commands and commissions that Jesus gave to us as his followers. It's all grounded in unity. It's not about just people pleasing or making everyone happy or anything like that. It's about being grounded in unity and reminded that we are all following a greater purpose. We see this lived out with the 12 disciples. So I don't know about you, but sometimes when we talk about the 12 disciples and, and, and I'm tempted to drift and, and sort of think about them in this way of like they all kind of look the same, act the same, come from the same place. Like they'd be 12 best friends if Jesus weren't there. And that could not be further from the truth. See, the 12 disciples, you, you had a tax collector, shrewd and mischievous by nature. Um, in fact, in their tax collecting days, they might have even taken some money from people sitting at the table with them. Yeah. Uh, you had fishermen who were her simple, hardworking people that would do whatever it takes to fill their nets and earn a living. You had zealots who were like, like ready to, to take the Roman Empire over and do it by force. These people, when you line them all up, the 12, these people from where they came from and, and who they were, they were diametrically opposed to one another. 
These people did not get along. There's nothing that says they should have been able to get along. And they had conflict. They had lots of times of not getting along amongst themselves. But they were able to resolve it. And it was because they were following the same Savior. They were united in their purpose. And they remained together. Friends, the same challenges for us today. In a world where a lot of things are diametrically opposed to one another. What would it look like to practice what we saw the 12 disciples do? And to be united in a greater purpose of following Jesus together in southwest Florida and beyond. What would it look like? And so we see Nehemiah do this. He's not simply just resolving conflict. No, no, no. He's chasing after a higher purpose of unity for his people. So in moments of conflict, what do we see him do? Well, the first one is he practices the pause. We already talked about this, where he pauses before he responds, right? He, he has wisdom and he seeks discernment before he takes action. The second one is he honestly confronts. What that means is he tells his truth in love. Or better yet, he tells his truth without wrath. Right? We see him do this. The third one is he creates accountability for himself and for others. He leads by example by to inviting the, the officials to be in accountability with the priests and Nehemiah alike. And then the last one is he models the change himself, where he leads out and says, I've done the same thing. I've wronged people, and I am wrong in doing that. So now we're going to do something different. And if we're chasing after this unity of purpose, if we're chasing after uh, trying to be united, not simply just to uh, keep conflict at bay, but if we're actually chasing after God, this is what it looks like. And this is how this story ends in Nehemiah Uh, Chapter 5, verse 13. It says, I also shook out the folds of my robe and said, in this way may God shake out of their house and possessions anyone who does not keep this promise. So may such a person be shaken out and emptied. And this the whole assembly said, amen, and praised the Lord, and the people did as they had promised. It's this beautiful scene where Nehemiah stands up And he pulls the pockets out of his robes. And I can imagine things shaking out of his robes, out of his pockets. The things buried deep in there. And he says, if there's anything in me or anything in you, may it be shaken out by the Lord so that we can hold our promise. May it be shaken out so I can walk closer with the Lord. There's these t-shirts that you can buy at Walmart that I've seen people wearing. And they just crack me up. You'll see it on the screen. It says, y'all need Jesus. If you're a parent, you probably want to wear this every now and then. I needed those this weekend. Yeah, yeah. Y'all need Jesus, right? Some of the stuff I saw, man. (laughs) When I was driving to church this morning, this guy cut me off, and I was just thinking, you need Jesus, bro, right? (laughs) But here's the deal. Before I can say, y'all need Jesus, I need Jesus. When it comes to conflict, when it comes to unity, when it comes to chasing after a greater purpose or the bigger picture, it has to start with me. So Nehemiah pulls out his pockets and shakes them off first to say, I'm the first one seeking this out. So several months ago, my beloved University of Kentucky Wildcats basketball team hosted a, amen, hosted a a scrimmage in eastern Kentucky in Pikeville. For those who are not familiar with Kentucky, that's Appalachia, right? They were in deep in Appalachia. And it's hard to get a Kentucky basketball ticket in, um, in Kentucky anywhere. It's like the Super Bowl every week. So you can imagine when they said that they were hosting a scrimmage, a practice there, tickets went like that. So during the game it's happening, uh, head coach John Calperi of the basketball team noticed this man on the screen. His name is Michael McGuire, and he's holding his son. And John Calipari couldn't take his eyes off of this man because it was clear where he just came from. He just came from the coal mines in eastern Kentucky after a 16-hour shift, exhausted, grueling work. And Michael didn't have time to run home and shake off the soot and the dirt out of, um, from being in the coal mine. He didn't have time to do that. 
But you know what he did shake off? He, he shook off the stares from the crowd. How can this man show up and look so dirty? He did shake off the extra few minutes that he could have had at work so that he can get in his car and race to get his son to his first ever basketball game. And what he also shook off was anything that could hinder him to keeping the main thing the main thing. And his purpose, as he was interviewed later, was that this was his son's first opportunity to go to a basketball game. He wasn't going to miss it. So for him, his purpose was his family, of putting his family first. He may have not been able to shake off the dirt off of his face, but he was able to shake other things off to keep the main thing the main thing. And so Grace Church, let me ask you this. What are the things that you need to shake out? For me, it's my pride, it's my anger, it's my greed, it's my jealousy, it's my self-righteousness. I need to shake those things off so that I can keep chasing after the Lord. And for each of us, I think we have things buried deep in our pockets that we need to shake off. So what is that for you? Is it addiction? Then let me invite you to join us on Friday nights for Choose Recovery. Is it loneliness? Then come join a group at Grace. Are you struggling with grief of a loss, a, a, a loss of a loved one? We have Grief Share every Wednesday night, and we'd love for you to join us there. Is your marriage on the rocks, on thin ice? Then come talk to one of us and let us help you get set up with a licensed therapist that can help your, you and walk with you. Students, this whole weekend you've been talking about what it means to live in harmony with God. And maybe there's something that God's stirring in your heart that you need to shake out of your life to give up to him so that you can walk with him. We've been talking the last several weeks, TB, how young people are leading this movement in our faith. And we believe that in you all, too. That you all can lead us old people by walking in harmony with God. So friends... Let's shake off the things together. Because did you see how our story ended? The people said, amen. Now that's not some fancy church word that we just say after prayer because we don't know what to say next. No, no, no. Amen means I agree. Let it be so. So Nehemiah says, let's shake these things off. So friends, Grace Church, let's agree to do it together. Let it be so. Let's stand together for prayer. So Lord, in the same spirit as Nehemiah, God, I want to own my own faults, my own mistakes, my pride, my anger, my sin. Lord, for me personally, I want to shake those things off so I can chase after you and keep you at the center, keep you as the main thing. God, for my brothers and sisters, my friends here today, each one of us have something that we can shake off that's been holding us down, that's been weighing us down. You invite us to shake those things off so that we can live in harmony with you. So may it be so for us, Lord. May it happen first with us. I pray this in Jesus' name. So friends, we're going to sing one last song of worship before we leave. Not with the trumpet. I'm going to save you from that, Bill. Give me a stay. But, me a stay. <laughs> but this may be a moment where the Lord is saying to you, yep, you got something buried pretty deep in your pockets right now. You need to shake that off. So maybe during this song, you want to make your, your seat a place of prayer. Spend time with the Lord. Our altar's here. This is just a public place for you to be with Jesus. And if you want someone to pray with you, just raise a hand and one of us would be happy to pray with you. But let's shake these things off. Let's chase after God. Let's allow the spirit of the living God to move through us right now in this moment, but with our lives every day.
Let's sing together.